Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, and I'm in the book of Philippians chapter 3, the book of Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to begin reading in verse 18 and go to the end of the chapter. Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 18 and reading through the end of the chapter. For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Therein is destruction, their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. They are focused on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. If we look at this passage of scripture this morning, as my brother would say on Sunday night, there's a whole bunch in this passage of scripture. In life, I don't know about you, does it seem like there is more certainty in life or less certainty in life? And as you think about that, I, I want us to see this morning that I believe as you read this passage of Scripture found in the book of Philippians, you've got Paul who is writing this letter to the church at Philippi. And he is hearing what is going on, what is taking place, and he's trying to remind them of the certainties of God, the certainties of Jesus Christ. And I think as believers today, we are hit so many times with so many different things that we need to be reminded of the certainties of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he is Lord, amen? He is Lord, and we're going to look at some other things here this morning about the certainties, and this is what Paul is trying to remind him, because there in verse 20, he's talking about our citizenship, you know, he, you know, and waiting, and so we're going to look at this this morning. Lloyd Douglas, he is the author, I mean, some of you remember um, um, The Robe, uh, he, wrote, he wrote about a violin teacher, and uh, this author, uh, Lloyd Douglas, he wrote about a violin teacher who had a studio <clears throat> in a building that housed other studios. And occasionally, Douglas would stop by the studio to visit his friend. And when he got there, he talked to his friend and he said, what's the good news for today? As he was shared, talking to his friend, he said, what is the good news for the day? And his friend, being a musician, picked up his tuning fork and struck it with a padded mallet. And as he struck it, the sound came forth, and his friend said, the good news today is that that is an A. Talking about the tone, talking about the tune there, the, the tone. And, and then he went on and he said, well, the soprano down the hall missed her high note and the piano across the hall is off key. But my friend, that sound you just heard from my tuning fork is an A. It was an A yesterday. It is an A today and it will be an A tomorrow. It will never change. The good news, my friend, is that that is... An A. And you say, Brother Frank, where, where, where are you going? Here, the, violin, the, the violinist was simply saying he had found something that was certain. He found something that was dependable. He found something unchanging in a changing and uncertain world that he knew that note was an A. As children of God this morning, as believers in Jesus Christ, 
Have you found something that is certain in Jesus Christ? Have you found something that in a, uncha- in a world that is changing by the moment, that you know for certain who Jesus is? Do you know for certain who Jesus is? In this passage of Scripture, as I read a moment ago, Paul here is talking about those certainties, and he's sharing with the early church. He said, look, there's some things that don't change. And yes, he was, Paul was not even there at the time, and he was in prison, but he wrote this. Because he said, there are some spiritual things that never change. You see, in our world today, as we know, things are changing. Churches are changing. And even sometimes people are trying to change the Word of God, aren't they? Yeah. They're trying to change the Word of God. They're trying to change what is said in the church, what is said in their community. And we need to see here Paul was reminding them and encouraged them of their Christian lives. I want you to go look up at verse 18 that we read just a moment ago. As Paul said, he said, For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. Their destiny, their, the destruction that they're trying to bring as they share with this. And then look at verse 20, jump down to verse 20 again. It says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship, and as we look at that, excuse me, <clears throat> some of my sinuses are draining, uh, but you didn't need to know that. Uh, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Try it again. As you know, in that day, many of the people, and especially even in Philippi, because Philippi, that area, they were a Roman colony, and many of them were Roman citizens. There were times when the roll would be called, and it would be called on a state level to see who was a Roman citizen. One of the songs we sang this morning it, it, that I asked Terry for us to sing is when the roll was called up yonder, will you be there? You know, as we think of that song and as we think of even today, I want you to know a couple things about that place called heaven. As we think about that, I think there's some certainties that we can look at our heavenly home. And one of them is it's going to be personal. It's going to be personal. It's a, a place for us. It's a place where we belong in a place that God has called for us. Heaven is our home. We have been made for heaven. It's also not only a personal home. It's a permanent home. We're not going to be moving around. We're going to be in heaven. I know for some of y'all, y'all love to move. But in heaven, you're going to be in heaven. You know, and, and, and as we think of that, look at verse 20. It says, but our, citizen, our citizenship is in heaven. That little word, two-letter verb word, is. That's where it is. And as we look at this, it, if you look at the Greek and, in, and, and, and go back and study that sentence, it makes reference to something that took place in the past. And what happened in the past extends unchanged unto the present and the future. And so when you look at that, again, it reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven because of what happened in the past, what is right now, and even in the future, our place is heaven. And we need to see the importance of that. 
We also need to be reminded, as, as in that day, Paul was reminding them that they were Roman citizens, but he said what the most important thing is, is that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And he was reminding them of that. Look with me over in Revelation chapter 21, verse seven, uh, 27. Uh, in Revelation 21, verse 27, says nothing... Now, it's talking about heaven. Nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. This morning, I want us to realize that as we think about heaven, it's, pers it's a personal home, it's a permanent home, and it is secure. Christ's eternal deity, he is there for us. Some of you might remember in your history or in your reading, there was a pastor named George W. Truett. He was pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas for 47 years. He told in his sermon, he said, the door to heaven it was, that was the title of his sermon, The Door to Heaven. And he told the story about an army surgeon who was riding across the battlefield during the Battle of Gettysburg. And as he was looking, this, this surgeon, as he was riding across, he was looking for soldiers who had fallen. And, and, and he was checking for any sign of life. And as he came to a trench and he looked down upon a soldier laying there upon his back, the surgeon thought to himself, I'm too late. He's already gone. But even as he was thinking it was too late to help him, he saw a faint smile on the lips of the wounded soldier. And so the surgeon dismounted and the surgeon knelt and put his ear to the lips of the soldier and heard him whispering, Here, here, here. And the surgeon started to shake the soldier and got him alert enough. He said, Why were you saying here? And very faintly, the dying soldier replied, They were calling the roll in heaven. And I was answering to my name. Guys, when the roll is called up yonder, will, you, will we be there? Are we trusting in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Are we ready to say, here am I, here am I? But there's another certainty. The second certainty is of a returning Redeemer. Look at verse 20 again in our passage. Again, it says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, even in that day, in Philippi and other areas, they were a Roman colony, and every once in a while, the emperor would come and make that tour of his territories and go through. And of course, you know, the emperor was coming and people would get excited and, and they would re recognize who that is or who that was, I should say. But, you know, this morning we need to realize that one day our Lord and Savior, he's the one that is coming to this earth again. Amen? Amen. And we need to see he is the one who's coming. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He is Jesus. He is Christ. And we need to see as Jesus is coming again that we need to be prepared. The one who is coming is the Savior. The one who redeems us from our sins. He's Jesus, the Son of Mary. So named by the angel. He is Christ, the promised Messiah. He is Lord, the name most used by his disciples. And the question for us, what is the attitude do we have today of Jesus' coming? 
You know, it's like as we were getting ready for swamp cabbage, some of you were excited. Some of us was dreading the day. In life, sometimes certain things take place, and some things we get excited about, some things we don't. Sometimes the longer we live, or the, lo- the longer we experience some things, we say, well, I used to, you know, when I was a kid, I really got excited about that, but I'm just not excited. Are we excited about the coming of Jesus Christ? I have found that in the coming of Jesus Christ that many times it's reversed. The younger we are, we're not that excited, but the older we are, we're getting a little excited. We realize our end is coming and we, you know, need to get things right. And are we looking for the Messiah? Are we eagerly waiting for him? We need to see today that, that we need to be prepared and we need to be ready to, to, to see what God has done. There was a pastor. He was flying to El Paso, Texas. And next to him was a chaplain who had been serving, and this is years back, serving in Vietnam. <clears throat> and so the pastor was talking with the chaplain. He said, yeah, I haven't been home in years And my wife and my daughter, I just can't wait to see them. And as they were flying through the night and as they got to the El Paso area, you know, it had been all darkness and then they could see the light of the city. And as they got closer, you could just see that chaplain looking out the window, looking and anticipating um, that that homecoming. And, And when he got into the airport, there was his wife and two small children. And just the excitement that he was home with his family. Is there going to be that type of excitement when Jesus comes? That excitement of seeing our Lord. This morning, we we need to, to realize the one who is coming. And then, I want you to look at one other little thing. It says there in verse 21, He will be transformed, I'm sorry, He will transform the body of our human condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to to subject everything to himself. The certainty of a blessed body. A lot of times we don't think about that. But of a blessed body. Think of the kind of body we have today. (laughs) Someone said, it's falling apart, preacher, it's falling apart. But what about the body of our Lord? Or what about what our body has become because of sin? You think of Adam and Eve and how they were made and designed, but because of sin, the destruction that took place. We think of the kind of body we have today. And we think of what we're going through with our body. But think with me this morning about the kind of body we shall have tomorrow. The body we will have when we unite with Jesus Christ. You know, it, it, it basically, in, in, in verse 21, it, it is telling us that Jesus will transform our lowly body so that they will be like his glorious body. Lowly is the word that is used in some of the translations there. And the glorious body that we will have. Even our Lord Jesus Christ says he had his body, and as it was renewed, we, we find, again, how people, they touched it, and Thomas was invi- invited to do that as well. It, it was a real body, but again, it was transformed, and we, we need to see today that we need to be transformed in many ways. If our sin nature continues to go its course, what will it do to us? It will totally destroy us. If that sin nature continues in us. But again, our Lord, our God came and gave us his only begotten son. And so that we could have that moment and have that period in our life where sin is answered. And we can have something new. 
I can imagine when Jesus appeared to his disciples in a room with locked doors and windows and and, and all those things, and there stood Jesus. I don't know what the disciples were thinking. They were thinking, man, he's been crucified. He's been put in a tomb. And here he stands. Here he stands. One day, we're going to be standing with him in a glorious body. We won't have to take all that medicine in the mornings, in the evenings, or at lunchtime. We won't have to do that anymore. Have any of you heard of the musician, let's see if I can pronounce his name, Arturo Tuscanini? that close? Okay. Uh, it, it's not a gospel choir. Okay. <laughs> he was a great musician. He was a conductor of a symphony, and he was the conductor uh, of the Metropolitan Opera in New York, uh, also the National Broadcasting Company Symphony Orchestra. But one day after Tuscanini had put his orchestra through a rigorous rehearsal and again, some of this is going to, uh, Beethoven's Fifth Sympathy. Symp- symp- yeah, that piece of music. <laughs> they had just gone through it. The second violinist leaned over to the first violinist. They must have been Baptists. And the old man, she said, if that old man, talking about Tuscanini, the conductor, if that old man scolds us, I'll push him off the platform. <laughs> but Tuscanini didn't scold them with his long white hair falling down across his shoulders. He extended his arms and opened them up to embrace his orchestra for what they had done. In that performance. Guys, there's going to be a day when Jesus opens those arms to embrace us and hug. Yesterday, one of the things I do like about Swamp Cabbage is that I get to see people that I hadn't seen for a while. And sometimes it's every year at Swamp Cabbage. But you know, this year, I had several in church, you, 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 I had several men that used to be in St. Matt's. And now they're out, they have families, they're doing good. And they came up to me and hugged me and thanked me and this church. I can't describe that feeling. To see them changed. And we know it's because of Jesus Christ. And I am thankful for the small part that we play. And loving them and encouraging them. And to see them come back. And what the Lord is doing in their life. But guys, this morning, what about us? What about us in the sense, let's not forget the certainties. God's word is a certainty. His love is a certainty. We can go through all of this and realize he has promised to come again. That's a certainty. And when he comes and how we will be changed, that is a certainty. And in our world today, he keeps trying to make things gray. But God's word is rich. It is pure. It is true. And we need to hold on to those certainties. Because one day, when that roll is called up yonder, I hope that we can say, I will be there. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time today. And Lord, may we see There are certainties that promise that you are coming again. There's also certainties 
that you will handle sin <clears throat> in your own way and that you will not stand for sin and that you will wipe away that sin. Lord, be with us today that we would see in this world that is changing, that we can stand strong in the certainties that you have given us, that we know that you're coming, and on that blessed day that we will be with you. We thank you in your son's name. Amen.